Welcome to KJV Cafe. Thanks for taking time out of your day to listen. Each episode of the cafe is dedicated to studying the Bible verse by verse from Genesis through Revelation. Your host here at the cafe is Bible teacher Clark Covington. Looks like the coffee is hot and ready, so let's get started. Amen. Glory to God. Welcome to the program. Welcome to the cafe, Pastor Clark Covington here with another episode of KJV Cafe. So glad that you're here to join us today as we go verse by verse through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And we're currently in Genesis chapter 19, verses 21 through 23. And so I'll recap these verses just to kind of get us right back on the same page, literally. Genesis 19, starting at 21. And he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow this city, for the which thou hast spoken. Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou become thither. Therefore the name of the city was called Zor. The sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zor. So we see um, Lot in the previous verses disputing with the angels, not wanting to go to the mountains. And the angels then say, okay, fair enough, go to Zor. We won't burn down Zor. And it was a near place that Lot went to. And we see Uh, that the sun was coming up when he enters into Zor. And then we see seven verse later um, that he feared to dwell in Zor and he went to a cave in the mountain. Seven, God's number of completion. So not, he wasn't in Zor very long, made a bad decision, didn't listen to God, tried to follow his own intellect to his own peril. And this is the idea that we're looking at, that it should be Lord, thy will, not my will. A very good attitude towards God is I'm not sure what the Lord will, you know, but I trust him, right? That's a very good attitude. A very poor attitude would be God's definitely going to do this. And so this must happen, right? Jesus didn't want to go and suffer on the cross, understandably to die the most brutal death man has ever died and to drink of that cup of sin, that bitter cup of sin for all humanity, past, present, and future. That's the idea of the atonement or the substitutionary death where Jesus had to go to the cross at Calvary to die for our sins, for your sins, for my sins. I think of my own sins. They're more than I could ever count. And every single one of them, Christ nailed to his cross through his body and died for me so that when I accept him and I accept that the shedding of that precious blood of Jesus, I'm saved and born again. I then have his righteousness appropriated to me. I then am saved and set free. I then no longer have a sin debt I can't pay. It's been paid by Christ. So when I go to heaven and I face God at the Bema seat, the judgment for the believer, all I can say is I accepted Christ. And all God would say then, as we understand the Bible, you're forgiven for your sins. Enter into your reward. It's a beautiful thing. Okay. So we see that. Christ didn't want to go to the cross, but he did anyway. He said, nevertheless, thy will, not my will. Yet Christians today, and I'm saying Christians, the believers today, are often saying my will, not thy will, right? And so what we're going to do is let's look at one of these examples in the Bible. And because we see, obviously see the example with Lot saying to God, literally like the angel of God, Lot saying, no, 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 not so. Not your will, my will. Okay, so we see that with Lot. But how about Matthew 19, 21 through 23? Jesus said unto him, If thou will be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then Jesus said unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. Okay? And then, of course, Jesus, you know, says that it, with God, all things are possible. So if you happen to be rich, you still can enter in. Yet it's hard, right? We see in verse 16 of Matthew 19. And behold, one came and said unto him, good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? That's a good question. We all want to know how, how can we go to heaven? And uh, verse 17, and he said unto him, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He saith unto him, which Jesus said, thou should do not murder, commit adultery, not steal, not bear false witness, honor thy father and mother. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. 
And the young man saith unto him, all these things have I kept from my youth. What lack I yet? And that's when Jesus says, if you'll be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor and come and follow me and you'll have treasure in heaven. And what does the young man do? He walks away sorrowful. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. See, we can hear from God directly. This young man heard from God incarnate, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, heard it face to face and couldn't accept it. Because in this world, where does riches get you? Whew. I mean, what, what wouldn't you? I mean, you can, if you're rich, you can have nice things, obviously. Go where you want. I mean, if you're rich, you have your own plane. You don't have to wait, <laughs> to wait through all the check-in at the airport. If you're rich, you can hire the best attorney if you do something bad and potentially get off. Uh, if you're rich, uh, you're popular. You know, you're, you're, you're desired. You're, you're wanted on committees and all the rest. Politicians want to get to know you. If you're really rich, celebrities would want to get to know you. Oh, I mean, if you're rich, I mean, the doors that it opens. And conversely, if you're poor, the pain and struggle that oftentimes you face of uh, you know just horrible companies that are preying upon the poor, lenders that are charging great amounts of interest, you know, food deserts, all the rest, problems, issues, crime-ridden places, bad landlords, whatever it may be. If you're poor, you're suffering and suffering. And so the young man maybe understands some of these things. And when he's told by Jesus to just go ahead and get rid of your possessions. And just to be clear, if thou be perfect, go and sell thou hast and give to the poor. So the process was not give it away, sell it, and then get the money and then give that to the poor. And you'll have treasure in heaven. So Jesus is saying trade the tangible for the intangible. Trade the carnal for the spiritual. Ch trade the worldly for the heavenly. And the worldly we can see. I mean, I'll give you an example. If you're rich, you could go and buy a swimming pool and then you could go swim in it, right? If you're poor in this world, but in heaven you're rich, you're not jumping in the pool right now. Does that make sense? Now, maybe later, you know, I don't know, but there's great reward, some kind of, but you can't see it. And that's the idea of faith, operating by faith. And it's a very challenging proposition uh, that, that, that most people really, I think, I think all people struggle with it. Uh, and, 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 and we see with Moses, a great scripture kind of correlating with this, um, Hebrews 11. Okay. Hebrews 11 by faith. When he was born, was he had three months of his parents? Cause he saw he was a proper child, not afraid of the King's commandment. Uh, verse 24 of Hebrews 11 by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And think about what that would mean. I mean, he'd be royalty and very rich. Choosing rather to suffer affliction, this is verse 25 of Hebrews 11, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful statement of what Moses did to forsake the, the, the riches of Egypt. So we have one example in Matthew 19 of the young boy that can, can't, can't part with it. And one example in Hebrews 11, obviously referring to the Old Testament, of Moses that he, he esteemed the riches of Christ greater than the riches he would have received as one of Pharaoh's or the king's own. And it's not hard to tell. You can look where there's still monarchies and kings in, in, in power. You can see that if you're in the um, line there, if you're in the family, you do quite well for yourself. I think of the Arabians or think of the British or wherever else. You know, if you're royalty, you're, you're not living... Uh, you know, too shabby, you know, and yet we know Moses was on the backside of the desert 40 years 
and then called to this mighty work of God 40 years in the wilderness with the Israelites. So we see God's ways are not our ways. And his challenge to man is just believe him. Lot has struggled with this throughout scripture, throughout Genesis. We see an individual that has trouble believing God at his word and following godly principles, respecting the elders. I mean, Abraham wasn't his dad, but I mean, it was kind of like it. You know, he was an elder, he was his uncle, and he didn't respect Abraham too much. You know, Sodom, you know, he lived outside of Sodom. He didn't move there, but then he ended up moving there. He's captured, probably nearly enslaved or killed, goes through a terrifying situation. Who rescues him? Abraham and, and his men. And what happens? He sees God's blessing on Abraham, the affirmation by Melchizedek, all these things happening. And what does he do? Goes right back to Sodom. <laughs> you know, Lot struggled with this idea, this principle, that trusting God is the best way. And do we not do the same? Let's take a break and we'll come back. I forgot to take a break. Let's take a break before the show ends. All right, hold on. Stay tuned. You're listening to KJV Cafe. We encourage you to look us up on your favorite podcast app and subscribe to our channel on YouTube. Now let's get back to some more in-depth Bible study. You know, are we not the same way? You know, do we not just wrestle with this idea of like earthly blessings versus what God calls us to? And by the way, I mean, if you read the Bible, God is not calling his ministers, his missionaries, his, uh, those that love him. He's not calling them to like, um, forsake, you know, live in a hut somewhere by themselves and eat tree leaves or something or plants from the dirt. He's not calling them for that, right? But carefully speaking, he's also not calling them to make the primary concern of their lives their own comfort, right? You know, our our founding documents say in the pursuit of happiness, you know, what do people say when they're doing well? We're living comfortably, right? And what God wants us to do is to get comfortable, I believe, with being uncomfortable so that we can be different than Lot when we're confronted by God when he's taken us away from the sinful place, when he's called us to the mountain, we can say, yes, Lord, that's scary. And I'm afraid, but Lord, you know best. And Lord, I will follow you. And of course, when you do that, what are you going to do? You're going to be praying all the time because you're in a situation that's not comfortable. And the Bible says to pray without ceasing. And so the scripture never contradicts itself. And so As we look at our lives, if we are struggling with challenges and snares, partly due to the fact that we're living for God, then you know you're living biblically. Amen? And if we look around and we're just fat and happy and don't have a single problem and can't find time to serve the Lord, then we really need to look in the mirror and pray to God and ask him to help us. Ask him to help us. Repent and say, Lord, I've been living for me. I need to live for you. Lord, whatever I have is yours. How about that commitment right there? He gave you breath. He gave you life. He gave you everything you've ever had. Why not give it back to him? Why not commit today to turn to God so that when you're in the fire, so to speak, when you're in the the, the perilous situation that is inevitable for all of us, one out of one dies, right? We're all going to die unless we get taken home in the rapture. When we're in these times of trouble, whether it's death, sickness, despair, war, conflict, we turn to him and we, we trust him because we know his ways are the best ways. And we know that we are our own worst enemy oftentimes, that when we make decisions on our own, we are saying, Lord, my will, not thy will. And that's very dangerous. Can you imagine if Jesus did it? Thank God he said, Lord, thy will, not my will, so that we could all be saved. Praise Jesus. Praise God. Seek his will in his way, even if it seems perplexing. Seek his will in his way, and he will bless you for it, I promise. If not right away, in the long term, you'll be so blessed for seeking him. Thank you for listening. Take care. God bless, and amen. Thanks for spending time with us today at the cafe. We would love to hear from you. You can email Brother Clark directly at clark at enduringpromise.org. See you again tomorrow. 
Same time, same place.